Vantage Point is um, a film that which probably evokes very, very different emotions when watching it. There really is no reality. I mean, what you see, what, you, what reality is, is what you make it and how you interpret what is happening. There's more than one dimension in, 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 in us as human beings and uh, this movie is very brave, and very courageous. It tries to tell a story, both entertaining, but human. Oh my God. What, 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 what did he see? This movie is one of those until the very, what you think you figured it out, but at the very end you go, wow. I was looking, I just finished Marie Antoinette with Sony and was looking for something that was a complete change of pace. And so when I read the script to Vantage Point, here was an action adventure thriller written, I thought, in a really unique style. The same 15 minutes shown six or seven times from different perspectives. And that originality seemed, uh, for me, was very attractive, the challenge to try and do that. The script, um, good, bad, or indifferent, was such a, a nightmare for a production point of view in that when you're reading about this presidential assassination moment or the bomb underneath the podium, and then you keep reading and you go, oh my God, it happens again, and it happens again, and how do I schedule for this? How do I plan for this? I think there's two decisions you make as a director about that make any difference to what you do, and that, that's uh, what, do you, what script are you gonna do and who's gonna be in it? And in all of those decisions and all the things I've done, I've tried to be bold. And this was a very bold story, and I loved the way it was risky and telling its story, and there was never any question for me that that was, that was why I should do it. Well, I think when we started, um, when I met Pete Travis, our, our director, you know, he had just finished a film called Oma, what Paul Greengrass had written and, and produced with Pete. And um, much in the same way that there was a reality to that and a way in which he'd, he dealt with the, um, the subject matter of Oma in a very real fashion. I think that's what everyone was looking for with Vantage Point, and I think that's what Pete translated. Well, I think what's wonderful about Pete's vision of this movie is that although it's very entertaining and, and, and very suspenseful and a beautifully made film, that what he is also saying is that we have to observe and recognize everyone's point of view. I think he's a very clever guy, very solid. I mean, he knows exactly what he wants, and, uh, and he understands, I mean, he really wants to explore human nature through these characters in the movie. So he really, he really uh, encourages us to go all the way and to explore all the different possibilities and all the emotions and all the, the layers that our characters have. And that's, uh, and that's great. I mean, that's what you dream of in terms of, of a director, you know, in a movie. He tries to talk to you really in a private way just to touch the point to motivate you, to warm you, to encourage you. And I feel that he's doing different things with each actor. So he tries to have different personalities, different rhythms, with different energies in each character. What are the chances he freaks out the minute we walk? I put it at 50-50. I've always loved Dennis. I think he's got a quintessentially American persona about him. And he's got a real old style movie star quality. He's a real man. And when he kind of like he suffers, you can see it in his face. He doesn't have to do anything for you to know that he's having a bad time. Well, we got to work with Dennis Quaid, who plays the Secret Service guy. It's a wonderful part for him, and he's a great actor. I'd, I'd, I'd never worked with him before, and he, um, he walked in, we all went, oh, it's Dennis Quaid. <laughs> I didn't realize, actually, in reading this, that how much how much of an action movie this this really is. It's all exciting stuff. It's fun stuff to do. It's like being a kid to, again to do all the action, you know. What I really was excited about when I met him for this was that he wanted to push it a little bit and to make Thomas Barnes. He's got a dark darkness at the center of him. You know, there's part of him that's not coping with the world, 
And that was really exciting to, for, for working with Dennis, that he wanted to go there. Thanks. For what? For getting me back out of here. Don't thank me yet. Matthew Fox is, is, is a really, really good actor and uh, a great guy. He brings a lot of layers to this character. What I loved about him, he was really passionate about the script. But also, he's the kind of quintessential American hero. He looks like a good guy. He's got, he's, you know, he's got, a, he's, he looks very tough, but again, he's got a wonderful vulnerability about him. And I was just really excited about working with him in a way that you were gonna twist people's expectations of who he is. Initially, the script, I'm sort of that kind of guy that, I mean, I just read scripts and they either speak to me or they don't. I mean, I thought it was just a really well-executed script. Again, I'm, I'm very fascinated by this concept of, of perspective. And, uh, and I was also drawn to playing a guy that, you know, you, you think is one thing and he turns out to be something completely different. And then in Rewind, when you go back and watch what he was doing at the top of the movie, in the first 15 minutes of the film, subtly orchestrating that so that when you watch it the first time you think he's doing one thing and then in rewind you're like oh my god that's what he was actually doing he seems like he's being a really nice guy and yet when you see the end of the movie and you realize who he really is you realize that all of those things that seemed nice were really barbed were really dark and even to some extent in some sometimes we played the scene twice in a different way. So when you see him do the performance that's at the end of the film, when you find out who he really is, the same line is delivered in a slightly different way than it was delivered at the beginning when you think he's something else. So we made a very conscious decision to do that in a way to kind of play with that. And Matthew really got into that and that was fantastic working with him like that because it was really exciting. You know, that's been, that's been really challenging and fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's like playing two things at once. I mean, it's, uh, it's acting within acting. Hey, you saw the shooter? No, but I saw something, like a flash of light. I saw a man in that room, sir. When ideas came up, like Forrest Whitaker, um, for the part of Lewicki, the, you know, plump Polish guy, it completely changed to Howard Lewis, you know, and, and became Forrest's character. But that was a beautiful suggestion that kind of came out of left field and it felt right, and so we were lucky enough to get Forrest in that role. Well, Forrest has always been an actor that you could care about. What, what we really wanted to do with this was make him someone that felt like he was going abroad for the first time and, and exploring new places. And I think he did that really well. I mean, I, what was really interesting, I, spoke, I was speaking to him about it, and he said that um, you told me that this was a movie about, was a kind of thriller. And he said, how come I spent the last three days running everywhere? It must be an action movie. No running. It's been challenging because also not only do we run, but they really like to see us run. So sometimes we run for blocks <laughs> with cameras, you know. So I think that's been pretty challenging for me. You know, I think Forrest has got a wonderful everyman quality to him. I think it's it's almost impossible not to love him, you know. Um, and yet he's got a kind of vulnerability about him, and I think also. He plays a man that's a bit lost. He, and he doesn't seem obviously heroic. He doesn't tend to play heroic characters. He's not Dennis Quaid. He's not, the girl, he's not normally the guy that gets the girl or the guy that saves the president. We make history. He doesn't even look like me. <laughs> and one of the things, obviously, about playing the president is that you, you get to play two people. Because one of them is the real president and one of them's a fake. And that's a really exciting proposition. And one of the beautiful things that William Hurt did was when, if you watch, again, if you watch the movie closely, you see that when he's being the double, he looks like an actor pretending to be somebody because he smiles inanely almost all of the time. If you look again at the moment where he comes out of the elevator as the double, you'll see a slight sort of hesitancy. Very subtle things that he did with wardrobe to just make his suit a little tighter, to make his smile a little bit more goofy. And you'll see this hesitation in his character as he nervously approaches the car, which is a complete difference to then when we see him as the real president in the back of the car. The shoulders are back, he's much more relaxed. It's so subtle, but side by side, you definitely see the difference. And 
I mean, it's a phenomenal ability to be able to pull off one character, and he does it too, twice. He's a very generous guy. He really shares his knowledge and his ideas with everyone, and it's great. I mean, for me, I mean, I'm a young actor that I'm just, you know, who's just starting, you know, his career. So to be exposed to, to such an energy, you know, it's, uh, it's been great. For me personally, as an actor, that's been the great thrill here. The thrill here is, is the group of actors they brought together, that were, that were brought together to be here. A an amazing, just delightful, intelligent, informed group of actors. I mean, some of our conversations on the set right here, I mean, we pull up a bunch of chairs here, we'll sit six or seven of us and just we'll talk about everything from current politics, every topic under the sun. Could very well be the defining moment Pull out presidency. four, three, this is insane. Rex is a kind of character that feels like they've seen the world. There's nothing that shocks them. They've seen every story imaginable, nothing that they come across. They're almost a little jaundiced. Like the world, everything, every, they've seen everything, they've done everything. And I thought, and Sigourney seemed like the perfect choice for that because she's got a toughness to her. She's kind of, you can imagine her being in charge as a director of that, of that OB unit, and yet, there's also a wonderful vulnerability about her in the sense that when the really terrible things happen and she sees Angie that's been killed, something just cracks. It was an interesting character, unlike anyone I've played, and uh, a, a very interesting world, because uh, I got to, you know, hang out at a, a news station for a few days, and it was a very, I could see why it was so addictive. Hey, who's that guy? What's he doing? Okay, fine, stay with that guy. Everyone else, give me Ashton. When I first thought about Enrique, there was only ever two actors in, in Spain that I really wanted. Um, Javier Bardem was, was somebody we talked about, and the, the other person was Eduardo. I met Eduardo, and from, one, from that moment when I met him, and that was probably six months before we started shooting, I knew he was the guy I wanted, because he was so passionate about the story, he really got the character, he really wanted to play that role, and he's just got a ferocious intensity to him, you know. I have to be really, really thankful to him, because one year later, uh, when the production uh, came back again, uh, he, he remembered me and he said, OK, I want a Spanish guy for this role. And I imagine the big studio producers, they would say, sorry, Spanish, who? Eduardo, who, who is this guy? We want big names in this film. What I like about Eduardo is that I think he's got a real kind of muscularity to the way he acts. He looks extraordinary, but he's got a real ordinaryness about him, in a sense that on screen, he's kind of magnetic. My character is a little bit like a bull. It's like, once he focused, he doesn't think about any other thing. And uh, I try to work even physically, this, this thing of the character, like a bull. And that's what I did, just, focus and put my head in front of me and go for it. He's, he's very in the moment, you know, and he, he takes chances and challenges himself and, 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 and that's great. I mean, that's, uh, that's what I think we all actors dream of in terms of performing with another actor that is, you know, like, 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 like giving you the ball back all the time. I would ask you again, where's my brother? And I think the great thing about Edgar is he captures that toughness and that vulnerability of that character beautifully. So he looks like a real mean so-and-so when he's got a gun in his hand and you wouldn't want to get in his way. But at the same time, when you see him thinking about what they're doing to his brother, you realize how much he's hurting inside. And although he's killing a lot of people and he looks really good with a gun, he doesn't, he's not doing it because he enjoys it. He's doing it because he has to. I think these characters really are three-dimensional, all of them, you know, and they, they have circumstances that they have to solve and, um, and they, they have a lot of contradictions that they have to work out somehow, you know, and that's what, attra that's what attracted me, you know, so strongly from, you know, from the, the, the script. What have you done to him? He's still in one piece. You should be happy about that. I remember the first thing I saw Eilat in was, was in Munich. 
And I just loved that. I thought she brought a kind of wonderful intensity to that, to Eric Banner's wife in that film. And so when we started casting for Veronica, she was like my number one choice. I went, all the, almost all of her scenes are peaks of the mountains that uh, she's going through. And I thought that would be very, very interesting. And it was very, very interesting. <laughs> also very tiring and demanding in a way because every scene needs, needed to be in, a, in the peak of the energy of that moment, which was very, very high. She goes for it all the way. I mean, she doesn't save anything. I mean, she doesn't save energy to get back from the places where she, where, where, where she goes to when she's performing. And that's a blessing. I mean, that's great. Vantage Point, we shot, we did shoot some second unit in Salamanca, uh, but primarily shot entirely in Mexico City. And with Mexico, the pros and the cons, obviously it's a complicated city, it's a massive city. Traffic, hard to get by. We're doing car chases in the middle of the city where 20 million people are trying to get to work. It, it was almost impossible. Mexico City, where we're, where we're shooting this, which is supposed to be Spain, it's like another character in the film. It's, it's a fantastic place. The people here are, are great, and the, the, the Mexican crew, they're, they're fantastic people, but it's, it's, it's a lot of things can go wrong. <laughs> Going to Mexico City in the summer, it's their rainy season. So for two hours of the day, it pours with rain big time. We've been waiting more than working because of the weather. So in, in that way, it wasn't that nice, I think, but on the other hand, it, and it added up some spice because people became a little anxious and angry <laughs> in what way and, and they needed to be. You have to be really focused and no matter when you're shooting the scene, you have to be really ready to, because you never know when, when you're going to shoot it, uh, depending on the rain or depending on the weather. It's a pain in the ass, but, but it's, it's part of us, it's part of Mexico and it has to be like this. It's the worst part of what we're doing because everything else is in our control. Uh, cost, crew, the structure, the building, everything. And then every day we're facing whether it's going to rain or not from 8 a.m. till 6 p.m. to the end of the shoot. So Amir had an, an terrible, an, an impossible job really to make it look sexy and sunny where the two thirds of our day it was raining. And well, you wouldn't know that from the movie and that's a credit to what he's done. And it looks beautiful. Amir Mokri was someone whose work we really respected and we really liked. He has a European sensibility, but meshed with a, a knowledge of uh, bigger budget movies, but has bounced around between smaller work and, and is not afraid to throw the camera up on his shoulder and go to work. I wanted this to be on hell, but I wanted it to be, feel big and feel sexy. Because for me, this is a movie that was kind of like death in the afternoon. It, if you want to do it in Spain, you want it to be hot. You want it to feel sexy, you want it to feel hot. You want it to feel sort of intense. Photographically, it's um, Amir Mokri did a lovely job. It's very much handheld, which is the you know the Vogue today with the, you know close in and um, handheld, very much fast cutting, um, and that has an energy to it. One of the one of the important principles that we tried to do was to make each telling of the story feel and look emotionally different depending on whose story we were telling. So we sat and talked, I talked, sat and talked with Amir, the DP, a lot about how we could make the points of views seem different sometimes. What we would do is we would set up a scenario and then shoot for two or three days Enrique's version of that event. And then the next two or three days we'd shoot Dennis Quaid's version of that event and then Forrest Whitaker's version of that event. So that meant the shooting was longer, but it meant that we could put the camera where that person was standing and we could see the world the way they were seeing it. So that was one of the things that we tried to do in the way we shot it, was that we specifically tried to place the camera in the position of the person whose story it was. You get different point of view, so you need to do the exact same scene, but with a different feeling to, to it, which is complex because on one hand you have to be truthful to the scene that you just did and then you have to play it a little bit differently for the character who's looking at you from a different point of view. 
So the difficulty was to maintain the intensity to because they are, we are talking about really deep emotions and we are shooting from different points of view of the same thing. But you, sometimes you are shooting really, really small pieces of the whole story. For everyone in this film, for, you know, it's, it's 15 minutes of, of, uh, of a story. So it's your 15 minutes of fame. You get to be a star for 15 minutes, then you're a glorified extra for the, <laughs> for the rest of the movie. As an actor, it's just like doing lots and lots of takes. And I've been in films where I've done takes forever. I mean, certain directors are really perfectionists, and like Fincher does a lot of takes. And, uh, I love working with him. But he definitely does more takes than we do here. You know, it got it got uh, it got a little slap happy up there. We had some days where, you know, we were all kind of cracking up about that. William and Dennis and, and all the guys, you know, were just sort of like, wow, how many times are we going to do this? But uh, that's the necessary. That's what this picture is. And you know, I knew going in it would be that way. But it's been it's been tricky. The whole point of this movie is that, depending on where, who you are, the world can seem different. And point of view is not just about what you see, it's about what you feel and who you are and, where, and your experiences of the world. The whole thing is about we think one thing and we reveal that it's actually not quite that. And the structure of the, uh, of the cutting was to do, was to try to strengthen all that part of it. There's one of the, Stuart's a phenomenal editor and I think he's got a real understanding of what, how to cut action in a way that can make it feel exciting but also human and real and emotional. Each time we're using the same action and that's what was complicated, to keep that fresh and hold back some of it if we could. So when you see it again, it looks a, a little fresher. And that's one of the great things I think he's done, he's really made each of the final moments feel like a real edge of your seat moment so that you don't want to go to the next story, you want to find out what happened to the first person whose story you've been following. All in all, we try, I try to construct this to give little bits more information and cliffhangers so the audience are left with a mystery. Surprised to see me alive? And one of the great things um, I think everybody's really proud of is the score really helps that. Atlee Overson, who's the composer, he, he really wanted, with a passion, to bring out the different characters, to almost have a different sound for each person. The word that kept coming to my mind when I was looking at the film was that the music needed to be smart. It needed to be intelligent because it is, there are parts when the music, in a way, knows more than the, than the film without hopefully giving too much away, but it needs to really tell the story. The score really makes you feel how all these lives have collided, and it really brings home the kind of sense of fate, the tragedy of the moment, the way the plan of everybody concerned has all fall hinged on this one little girl running into the road. And it's just a wonderful combination of the camera, the sound, the music, everything brings it together in a, in a really exciting way. I'm really, that, I think that works really well. The score was really a fantastic opportunity to write really, really different pieces of music. You know, you go from sort of kind of this romantic, heartfelt um, flamenco guitar melody with some electronic undercurrents to these frantic action cues to this passionate doo-doo tango between Enrique and Veronica. And, uh, you know, and then in the end, can you do that and still make it sound like it's one score? It's, it's all coming from the same place. And um, I think we did that. It's got such um, range and scope, and yet Pete Travis, our director, has been able to really make it very human. And uh, each character, no matter sort of what side they're on, there's something touching about them. There's something you can understand about them. And I, I, so I, I think the whole, the whole idea of repeating as you get 
further and further into this web is really fascinating. None of the action films do, which is a little time to think because it evolves truth from all kinds of directions. Truth is complex. Truth has many points of views. And I think this film is about that as well. While you are watching the film, you are changing your mind and you are changing your point of view and you are realizing that things are not as you thought that they were. So that's really interesting. For real life, you know, it's like, I like that idea of change your point of view. And that's been the fun of it, and I think, and I'm very proud of it, and I think it, uh, it tells its story in a very exciting way. It's a ride, but actually at the same time, it shows you that, you know, there's different points of view in the world. It's, it's a big action film. It, it, the, the action is very exciting, and yet it tells its story in a very complicated way. We got a great group of people together uh, with a great team and, and managed to pull off a, a great movie, and uh, I'm very proud of what we did.